Lord. Hold on, hold on, hold on. And you know, I do want to tell you that I appreciate the people in this church. Uh, Brother John, I wish he was here for me to say this, but he has once again proved himself a godsend. And, and I mean that when I say that. Uh, we were going to baptize uh, a couple of people on Wednesday, and the water heater went out, blew out, and the electricity, it turned out it was all hooked up wrong anyway. We've had that water heater since 1981. So, you know, it's something that we need to get taken care of. Not I was us. able to go down. Huh? Not us. <laughs> well, we didn't. The church. The church. It's, well, I was in the church, girl. I'm not. I got to go in that much detail. Anyways. We've had this for a long time. I was able to go to Home Depot, buy us a new one with the church money, of course, and have it installed Saturday just to make sure we have it in by Sunday so we can baptize these two wonderful children back here in Jesus' name. So I'm just so excited, and I appreciate John so much. By the time we get done with all the stuff that we're almost done with, I'm going to say that John has probably saved us somewhere in the realm of approximately $10,000. That's a lot of money. That is a lot of money, praise God. Now, we've also been there for John, and we've helped John in many ways, and so it's been a give and take, uh, but I just appreciate him so much. Uh, so I'm still going to bust his chops, but I appreciate what he's doing. Maybe he felt like he did a little extra so he could take a break from church today, but that's not how it works. We need to be in the house of the Lord on a regular basis. Can I get amen? Amen. So what we're going to do now is we're going to say happy birthday. The sister Tiffany, <laughs> this time it is your birthday, I know. So why don't we stand and give honor to sister Tiffany. She is one of the most faithful people in this church. She loves God with all that she has. And she has just brought herself uh, to this place with her family on a regular basis, regardless of living so far away. I appreciate her. I love her. And let's sing happy birthday to sister Tiffany. Amen. A happy birthday to you. A happy birthday to you. Jesus. Every year, you have an opportunity to testify on your birthday so that we make sure everybody gets a chance because everybody was born, right? We don't have, we don't have any immaculate conceptions here that I know of. Praise the Lord. Sister Tiffany, would you like to testify? No? no I was going to say, girl, don't make me force you. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you, everyone. But glory be to God. This year I'm so thankful for um, me and my husband taking on the youth ministry. It's been a blessing and I can't wait to see what God's going to do in all our youth. So, amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you. Let me give you my sideways grandma hug with a affectionate tap on the side of the head. Praise God. I usually don't hug the ladies, but if I do, it's going to be like you grandma. Sideways and head taps. See, that's affection to be old. Praise the Lord. I want you to know that uh, I'm just very grateful for people like Tiffany who put in their all. Um, I'm grateful that we have people who can say, I put in my all to God. I want us to uh, follow Tiffany's example and Eric's example and my example, uh, the White's example of just giving alls. And we have people that are doing it. I, I love it. I, you can start naming names and you get yourself in trouble. But, you know, I see so many of you in here that are putting in, we've got a whole bunch of new converts that have just been coming to Bible study. They came to Thanksgiving dinner with us on, on uh, Thanksgiving here at the church. Uh, there's just so many people that are, it's like a fresh crop of souls. And I'm just encouraged, I want to continue to, to, to pray for you and bless you that you would move forward in the Lord. Praise God. Thank God my child is asleep. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. That's all he needed was a, a, a nap. He was tired. Any of y'all ever get like that when you're tired? Yeah! I do. Praise the Lord. Sunday school may not be dismissed. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. Let's hope I can get this. Oh boy. Okay. 
That'll work. <laughs> praise God. Praise God. Before I continue, I'd like to share with you something that happened on Wednesday. Um, my praise the Lord. I had a very um, difficult moment on Wednesday. Some of you were here. See, y'all miss Wednesday. All kinds of fun things happen on Wednesday. I made one of the biggest uh, embarrassing moments as a pastor I think I've ever experienced. In five and a half years, I think I turned red. It was embarrassing. Oh my goodness. I was telling Brother Eric before church. Um, I was telling the church that, and, and I'm going to get to this in a minute because we got plenty of time. I was telling the church that there's something that we have to be to the world. Were you here Wednesday, Sister Sterling? You, oh, you missed it, girl. Man. There is something that we are. By the way, we had about 40 people here on Thanksgiving Eve, which was awesome. So I want to thank all those that decided to come. I know some of you were traveling. Some of you were unavailable, and that's okay. But we were open for church. But I'm sitting here, and, I, and, and it messed me up for the rest of the service. My wife said it was a great service, and my preacher was good, which, you know, she's the roughest on me than anybody. So, but I was so distracted, maybe my own head, I was so embarrassed. I was telling the church, there is something we need to be to the world. And, and you know, sometimes I do this. It starts with an E. And I said, now, come on, somebody give it to me. Somebody, the people who were here were like, oh, yeah, that's what you're talking about. Oh, Lord, that was funny. Starts with an E. And someone said, example. And I'm like, great. But that's not it. You know, and I'm, we went on for about a good minute. And finally, I said, I'll give it to you. Ambassador. We need to be an ambassador. My wife, of course, so, so very eloquently went, that starts with an A. <laughs> I'm like, you got to be kidding me. And to, to make it worse, I'm sitting here quizzing everybody to give me the right word. And I obviously could not spell it. The cool thing is, is that, you know, and I really, I've, I mean, I have a master's degree for goodness sake. And I can't spell ambassador. Holy moly. But, I, but my wife, because she saw how bad I felt about it, I really, I really was affected. Even through the whole sermon, I felt like, you are the biggest dummy. You should even be up here. You can't even spell. And, uh, you know, my spell check has ruined me on my computer. I know that. But my wife actually gave me an out. Not an out, but a, a kind of a reasonable explanation, which I was very happy to hear. See, I was thinking that, you know, whenever I see ambassador, I'm thinking EMB, you know. But the fact is, how do you spell embassy? EMB. So I'm thinking embassy and being the person that puts things together. You know, if, if, if you have an embassy, the people in the embassy are the ambassadors. But they switched it on me. You know, just like the knife. I mean, come on, really? What are you trying to kill our kids? What these trying to teach them words? How do you spell knife? How do you say knife? You don't say knife. You say knife. Why did they put the K there? For what? What purpose does it have to have a K and knife? Then let me ask you, why are you going to switch it to A? Just leave it E. It's an embassy ambassador. Why you got to switch to A? Okay, now. Thank God, my wife gave me that. I feel much better. I felt uh, this big, and I was grateful we didn't record it, but I just said all on recorder now, but that's all right. <laughs> but I think if, if that's the worst thing that I've done in five and a half years of preaching here as a pastor, and I've done many years of preaching before that, uh, I think I'm doing all right. I've heard preachers say curse words by accident. I've heard them say all kinds of things. There's another one I said that wasn't so bad when I was in Mother Church. I, I would say sexual immorality. Immorality, I was trying to say sexual immorality, and I said sexual immortality. And then I kept trying to say it again, sexual immorality, I kept saying it wrong. Uh, but that was funny, but I think this one was worse. But anyway, if you'll open up your Bibles to Jeremiah 17 and 9. I'm trying to start light because we are going to get heavy today. <sighs> Whew, we are going to get heavy. I feel it, I feel it already. Today's message has kind of a two-part orientation. It's got a title, but it's also got a focus. 
Today's message is entitled, From the Pig Pen to the Palace. And the inflection that it's going to come out of is passion of the flesh versus passion of the Christ. How many people saw the movie Passion of the Christ? Well, I'm here to tell you that there is a passion that we can be involved in that has just as much passion, just as much um, activity in, in movement, but movement in the wrong direction, and that's passion of the flesh. And there are those of us that have passion in the flesh, and we're going to talk about that today. Jeremiah 17 and 9 reads as follows. The heart is deceitful above all things. Someone say all. I mean, come on. Above all things and desperately wicked. Someone say wicked. wicked. We're talking about the heart now. And it goes on to say, who can know it? You know what that means? That means that we should not trust our heart. I'm going I'm to work on that in a minute. Verse 10. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doing. Let's preach. Let's pray. I'm sorry. Jesus, we ask you right now to be with us as we go down a journey into understanding of sin, flesh, passion, and Jesus and how they're related. God, I ask you to give the church understanding that would take them to a different level of understanding and worship and maturity. In Jesus' name, and the church said amen. Let's just clap on the Lord one more time. He is an awesome God. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Man, I got so much going through my head right now. It's not even funny. Praise God. You know, if, if we were going to name, according to this message or this idea, if we were going to name the church, it would be New Hope Missionary Pentecostal Church. Because that's what we're doing here. We're here uh, in the mission field of winning souls. And this is... You know, we have a, a great deal of people here that are, are newer Christians or have become a, uh, an advanced level of Christianity from where they were, advanced level of understanding from where they were, not just staying the same, but coming to the next level. And, and the funny part is that, you know, if you want to see the levels that you can go, imagine yourself standing at the base of the new, uh, what's that new building? It's not Empire State anymore. What's it called? Victory Building or something like that or, anyway. Huh? No, that's the that's ground zero is the place below it. But let's just say a skyscraper. 100 stories, 150 stories. Just When you look at where you are to go with God, when you come out of a modern day Christian mindset and into uh, the reality of the apostolic faith, and then it's like standing at the base of the skyscraper. And where you have to go is up. And you've got many levels. That's just the beginning. Whereas when you're in a modern day Christian mindset, you come in and you just kind of come in at... at, at underground level and stay there. So, uh, you know, when I'm thinking about these things that the Lord is showing me, the Lord has given me kind of a, an insight onto a different kind of passion. Not just a passion for God, but what keeps us from being in a place of having passion for God like Jesus had a passion for us of the Christ is about what he was willing to do for us. So if we're going to have passion and we're going to be like him, we have to act like him. I know it's a cliche, but what would Jesus do? There's, there's a whole bunch more than just, that is in itself doesn't say enough for what it means. So we have this idea that there is this passion that we have, but I'm here to tell you the Lord was showing me in such clear ways that what we're looking for is revival. We're looking to be revived as a people, as a church. We're looking to be uh, saturated and blessed and transformed. And we're looking to grow into something and someone who has power, anointing, and who is a, a clear example or ambassador, ambassador for Christ. And so as we are doing this, 
We have to recognize that if there's a goal, there's also something that can keep us from that goal. Revival comes from people who come to the altar, or in their seats, because it's happened either way, but you know, a lot of people come to the altar. But there's something special about an altar, and when people sacrifice themselves in their self-comfort zone to come to this place and raise their hands, the Lord begins to recognize that sacrifice a lot more, and they feel more, and the passion begins to build towards Christ. And so when we have a bunch of people coming in here, we're in revival right now. We've got a whole family here. We've got a whole family there. We've got a whole family here. We've got a whole family there. And then we got some of our people who were here before. But just look at this room right now. They've been here for a while. She's been here for a while. And they've been here for a while. And they've been here for a while. He's been here for a while. He's been here for a while. Everybody else is new. Everybody else is new. We're in revival. We have a revival church. People are coming in. They're getting repented, baptized, getting the Holy Ghost. They're getting trained. They're getting taught. They're getting directed. And so when we have revival, there's something that's going to come against revival. And I'm going to tell you what that is. See, when you got people coming and repenting and coming close to God, that in itself stirs the whole church to a place where we're ignited in his power. But the exact opposite also happens, whereas when people are not coming to God, when they're falling away, even in their seats. You haven't left the church yet, but you're still falling away in your seat. Because when you come to church, you go home, you live like the devil again. And you don't hold on to the concepts that we're talking about for long enough. Now, the goal is for it to be longer. You come in, you come to church, and, you know, it may be a couple hours you're able to hold on to your repentance. And, and, and then, you know, you come back to church, and the next time you go home, you know, it's a half a day. And, and, and after maybe a month, you go home after church, and you're able to make it a couple of days. And then, you know, the day before you're supposed to go back to church, you're tripping again. But then the goal is after you've been here for a long period of time that you're able to go to church on Sunday and make it to Wednesday. And then come to church Wednesday, get refilled, and then make it to Sunday again on a regular, continual basis. But what happens is, is when people are not coming to God the way they should, and this happens a lot with new people, which is sometimes uh, somewhat, some level normal. You've been around for a long time, and this is still happening. It is not normal. But you got people who come, and this happens in different phases. you got people who are new or people who have been around for a while, and, and both groups have people who are still in sin at home. They're still in sin at home. And so if, if revival comes from repentance, then backsliding and just people living in a regular sinful life, that slows down revival. Because how can you find your voice when your voice is being muffled by the hand of the devil? Because see, when you're, cre you're a creation of God. And so when you are doing right, you have the ability to, ah, 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 I can't wait to get to church. Oh, I'm going to shout. I can't wait to, to be in God's presence because I'm doing right. And I love to go in and just be there and be right with God. But when you're not right with God, you come into the church and you're still coming in. And this goes for new converts too. That's why you've got to grab on and got to hold on with everything you got. And don't let go. And if you let go, grab on again real quick. But when you've got a situation where you're not repented, and you're not having the victory in your life, and you know it because you're the creation, and you know how you're supposed to be living, you know God is touching your life, but then you go back, and you go back to that sin that so easily besets us. How can you come in? Ah! You notice my head's down, and... And, and, and this may not be on the outside, this is on the inside, but it could be on the outside too. But you can't, how can you really get a, how are you going to run the house? How are you going to run the house and be like, whoo, when you got chains on your legs? You're in shackles and you can't even run. But you can still walk into the house of the Lord. So we have a position where revival is actually slowed. Well, the power of revival, and, and you know, it's, it's so interesting because we have a balance because we have a bunch of people coming in and that's great, but that's why this, I'm going to explain it to you because you can say, well, pastor, why is this church so loud? Why do we have so much excitement and power? Well, it's because we got so many people who are coming in on a regular basis. On a regular basis, we got new people coming into church, coming to the altar, getting the Holy Ghost, getting baptized, and then it becomes a revolving door. 
and they go right back out. And we have some, this is, we have in two levels. We have new converts that are coming and going all the time. And then we have people who have been around for a while coming and going all the time. And they show up for a week or two and then they're gone again. Now I'm here to tell you that both are true. Revival can be stifled or can be slowed down. But the only reason why this church has maintained its level of power, because we've had an influx of souls every month. People getting baptized, people getting the Holy Ghost. So we're staying in revival regardless of what other people are doing. Look at all the people who are not here. Look at all the people who have left. Because we had all these people who are new, and then a couple of outskirts that have been here for a while. Where is everybody else? We're talking about people that have been in the church for a while. They keep allowing that passion to go in the wrong direction. Are you going to have passion for Christ? Or are you going to have passion for the flesh? That's what we're going to talk about today. Here it talks about very clearly that when people are passionate, passion usually comes from the heart. And so I've heard so many times in my walk and service to the Lord, Oh, uh, uh, God knows my heart. So what that is, is an excuse to say, why someone is not acting at the level of revival that they should because of sin and trying to explain it away by saying, but God understands my heart. He knows my heart. So even though I'm not living where I should be, God's okay with it. That's a lie from the devil. And this scripture proves it. Man, we're going to do some hard preaching today. You better put your toes under your seat because we're going to preach today. You know why? Because this preacher wants revival. And this is what the Lord gave me to give you. And I have no authority to give you anything else than what God gives me. So we're going to have church today. Can I get an amen? amen? Praise God. It says that our heart is wicked. Des you know, thank you, Eric. It does not, it's not just wicked. It's desperately wicked. What is the Lord trying to tell you? We cannot trust our heart. Our heart can be deceptive. It can trick us. When it says who can know it means, how can I trust it? Oh, but I feel in my heart that this is, come on, somebody hear me, I'm about to preach. Oh, but I know in my heart that this is the best thing for me to do. How dare you trust your heart? Have you read the word? You need to trust the word, not your heart. Because see, especially when your heart is guiding you to do something that's either sinful or is going to take you out of your relationship with intimacy with God or take you out of the house of God, I am sorry, it is not of God. So if it's not of God, the enemy can use your heart against you. The enemy can use your heart against you. He can put in your mind and in your imagination, we're going to prove this in a minute through the scripture, he'll put it in your mind that it's okay to do something that's ungodly. And he'll use your heart to do it. I feel it in my heart that this is just what I need to do. I'm here to teach you that you can't trust your heart. Your heart is not what you need to look at. It goes on to say, the Lord searches the heart. I try the reins even to give every man according to his ways. So God is going to look at you and say, okay, what are you doing? And if you are going to do wrong, God's going to hold you accountable to that, which just goes along with what I'm saying. You can't say God knows my heart. God, yeah, he knows your heart, all right. He knows that it's wicked. He knows he doesn't want you to trust it. He wants you to trust him and his word. And whatever you do, you're going to be held accountable for it if it's supposed to be something that is taking you out of God's will. And if it's taking you out of God's will, it's taking you out of revival. Because you're not getting revived, you're dying. Oh, come on, somebody. Because that's what sin brings, is death. So how can you be revived and be in revival as you are slowly dying as a result of the sin that so easily besets us and feels good, smells good, tastes good? We are in a battle. Get ready for the fight. Get ready for the fight. We're going to be rewarded according to our fruits. So if we're going to 
do the right thing and act the right way, we will be rewarded according to that behavior. If we're going to do the wrong thing and act the wrong way, it's not going to be, oh, well, God just knows my heart, and so it's going to be forgiven or it's going to be, you know, uh, ignored. No. Because he says that at one time he did wink at the ignorance of man, but now he doesn't wink anymore. He gave you accountability. He gave the ability to be free. He equipped you with everything you need. Now you've got to grab hold of it and live in it. Wear your armor. Fight with your armor. Use your weapons. And if you don't, you are responsible. I am responsible. This is the problem. People have a passion for sin. If you have a passion for sin, it can turn into an addiction. What is an addiction? Compulsion? Loss of control? How about the desire to lose control? Because see, uh, when you're drinking and doing drugs and, you know, as a former addict and, and, and educator for substance abuse, I, I know this clearly very well. The whole goal of an addict or a drug addict or alcoholic or somebody is to lose control. Because when you're drunk, you don't get more control, you lose control. When you get high, you lose control and smoke marijuana. Teenagers, pay attention. You're losing control of your mind. And after a while, you'll lose control of your behavior. Because when your mind is gone, so is your behavior. Because the things that you used to do that were fun are no longer fun because your body only wants the endorphins that come through smoking weed. So after a period of time, nothing else is fun except weed. And now you've lost control of your whole life. What do you do when you do cocaine? You lose control. You lose your mind. That's the whole goal. LSD acid. Acid is probably the best example. Just go crazy. Hey man, let's drop acid. Let's just go crazy. I, I want to have it on hallucination. That's saying I want to lose my mind. We lose control. An addiction is the state of being compelled. That compulsion that comes with addiction. Inner drive or obsession. Now, if you think about something on a regular basis or you get involved in the same behavior on a regular basis, would you say that you're obsessed with doing that behavior? So if, we're, if we have a sin in our lives that we cannot get rid of, we come to church. See, let me give you an example of how this works. I'm dealing with a young man right now who doesn't know if he's addicted or not. He doesn't think he's addicted to marijuana. Uh, he's a friend of a friend of mine, and I'm working with that family, and I'm working with this kid, and, and, and I'm working with him, and he's telling me, I don't, think I'm, I, don't, I don't think I'm that bad. I don't think I have an addiction. And I said, well, let's talk about your behavior and see if your behavior matches your thinking. The person's already in trouble with the law. They're in trouble with school. They've been thrown out of their house. And they've, been, they've, they've completely disrespected the people they live with. And they've been told that they have to stop and they've been unable to stop. All five things are complete indications of addiction. Period. They have an obsession with the usage of, of this drug and they cannot stop. And it's destroying everything around them. And his mind is saying there's nothing wrong. One of the greatest weapons that the enemy has ever created is to get you to believe he does not exist. Do you know how many people who are not in any kind of church, at least if someone is in some kind of Christian church, they're walking around with the belief that there's a God and there's a devil. Generally, in most churches. There are some churches where you just come together and kumbaya. There's no devil, there's no God. There's just, there's just oh, praise, love, love. There's just love. That's it. And, you know, I'm not going to be doing robes and tambourines. We're not doing that. But understand, there is this mindset that there is no God, there's no devil at all. Not only is there no God, but there's no devil. And a great number, a majority of the people in this world, they just live for their lives. They live to make money. They live to be comfortable. They live to feel good, taste good, smell good. And, and they just live for themselves. How selfish is that? Once we, those that understand there's a God. And I'm not judging them, I'm just saying that they don't even know that they're in that state of mind. Just like someone who doesn't think they're a drug addict, but they're in that state of mind, they don't even know it. There's people in this church, and I'm not pointing fingers, I'm not even going to look over there right now, so nobody can say I'm looking at you. But there are people in this church. (laughs) 
There are people in this church who are in a position where they do not believe that they are in a position of doing wrong with God even though they have got a whole lot of sin in their lives. And they allow themselves to continue to be involved in that sin and that behavior and they do not believe that they're, they're in, uh, in a position where God is going to hold them accountable or that God is upset with them. The greatest gift of God is light so that we can see so that we can see. And if we think that we're in a position uh, that we can be obsessed in things of this world and, in, and, and, and sin and be okay with God, then we are being tricked. One of his greatest weapons is to get you to believe he doesn't exist. Because if he doesn't exist, there's nothing to fight. We got to get ready for the fight. Now, that being said, we've got a person who has a strong, this is the psychology of it, who has a strong, usually irresistible impulse to perform an act, and I'm going to say a sinful act. It doesn't have to be crack, it doesn't have to be heroin. As a matter of fact, God gave me this understanding that I'm giving you today that's not even, because usually I describe myself. I describe my own impulses so that you can see that you can have victory over an impulse. But God didn't show me my own impulses last night and this morning. He showed me the church's impulses. Where we are in a position where we want to reach out to God and we want to love God. But we have a compulsion to sin. And I'm here to tell you that you were maybe even born with that. But that's why we got to be born again. Woo! Come on. You may have been born with the compulsion and the modern day church wants to say, hey, that's how we are and that's what happens. But guess what? They don't teach you have to be born again. Or if they do, they don't describe it as what it really is. We just become a new creation. If I was having a compulsion for sin as a sinner and then I get saved, then I become changed. And I don't have that compulsion anymore. Now, now, I talked about the greatest weapon. The greatest weapon that he has, the devil has in the modern day Christian church is to, to, to say that he does exist, but when you are living for him, you're still okay with God. You're still in your compulsion of your sin, but you're still okay with God. That is one, that's, that's the second greatest weapon that he has. Because first he tricked the world, now he's tricking the church. But we have light. We have a light that exposes that yes, I do have to repent. I do have to turn from my sin. I do have to get baptized in Jesus' name for the remission.